What's up my fellow small business supporters? Back when I was in the early days of my woman in business, my entrepreneurship, my boss babe journey, one of the very first ever self-help books that I read to help me learn more about being in business as a woman was Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg, considered one of the best-selling books about being a woman in business of all time. And there were things about this book that I thought were really helpful, but also I didn't find the book that useful overall. I actually did a brief review of this book in my business books tier ranking video that I did, and I mentioned it in another video way back in the day. So I've reviewed that book on this channel a couple times now, and in my own book, Savvy Business Owner, I talked at the beginning about how this book does have some helpful information about the world of navigating the systemic disadvantages that a lot of mothers specifically in the workplace have, which didn't resonate with me because I'm not a mother, I don't ever intend to have children or anything, so that didn't really stick with me. However, there were some flaws in that as well as the book did come at it from a very privileged perspective from the perspective of Sheryl Sandberg, who is someone who was the COO of Facebook and who was once offered the position to be the CEO of LinkedIn, who went to Harvard Business School, who had a lot of connections and opportunities that the average woman trying to start their own business probably doesn't have. Again, I'm not going to fully review it again. I'll link up in the cards the video where I already reviewed it. This book was one of the early places where I felt some levels of disappointment appointment on my journey of searching for a good book for women in business. And I've since found plenty. Again, check out the tier ranking video. But this was one of the books that, along with Girl, Wash Your Face, inspired me to start reviewing some of these boss babe, girl boss type of books on my channel as kind of my thing. <laughs> and recently I saw an article from The Atlantic come out talking about Sheryl Sandberg and about her impact on our culture of work and what it means and whether it relates to feminism or not. So I I thought I would take a look at that article and react to it with you guys today because it's something I've never read before and I'm very interested in seeing what it says. This article is recent. It came out a little over a month ago on June 18th, 2022, and it is called Sheryl Sandberg and the Crackling Hellfire of Corporate America. Is this feminism? Let's find out. Hit you some nuts. There was lots of memes. Makes me wonder if I should take up lesbianism. Chicago. You guys asked for it. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel, or if you're new, welcome for the first time. I'm Savvy, and this is Savvy Writes Books, the channel where we talk about books and business. If you're new here, don't forget to subscribe. Every Friday at 11 a.m. Central Time, I have new videos coming out. I also put out bonus videos throughout the rest of the week because I just have a lot of things to talk about. And if for some weird reason you really like listening to me talk, every single weekday morning at 7 a.m. Central Time, I host a live stream with my friend on my second channel called Your Morning Guru, where we do a little show to wake you up in the morning. We're better than Good Morning America. I said so, that makes it true. So subscribe to that as well. Now, let's take a look at this article breaking down the crackling hellfire of corporate America and how exactly that relates to feminism and the empowerment of women in business. Or if that's even the goal we should be striving for in the first place. Let's find out. All right, so here is this article on The Atlantic by Caitlin Flanagan. In publishing, there are some books that are too big to fail. Very early on, you get the message that this is a major and very important book. In 2013, that book was Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In, Women, Work, and the Will to Lead, which sold more than 1.5 million copies in its first year. She was the chief operating officer of Facebook, back when most of us had no understanding of the platform's fearsome powers, in the halcyon days when we thought it was just for sharing pictures of the grandkids and ruining marriages. The book was about how women can make it to the top. It was a sort of work-life balance category buster because she was telling women to pretty much forget about the life part. I don't know if I fully agree with that. I'm gonna wait and see what some of the examples she gives are. For all the complaints that I did have about the book, I really didn't think that it talked about forgetting about the life part because, as I said, and maybe this is because I was coming at it from the perspective of someone who doesn't have kids. I'm not sure if the author of this article has kids or not, but from the perspective of someone who doesn't have kids, to me it felt like it focused too much on the life part because she talked so much about what it was like to struggle to balance having children and working in a very demanding, lots of hours a week, very high level type of position, which I imagine is really, really hard. People are always asking me, hey, Savvy, how do you manage to run your YouTube channel and run your morning show and run your business and also write your books and also have your hobbies? How do you manage to do all that? And I'm like, well, the answer literally is that I don't have kids. And, I, and that's a shit answer because it's like, that's not advice I can give you, but it's also just kind of the truth that 
when you are also responsible for the lives of other people, it becomes a lot harder to be able to focus on yourself. That's just the truth. And it, I mean, it's also not to say that doing your job is focusing on yourself because we all have to work to live. We don't all have to work as the COO of Facebook to live, but that's what she was doing, right? In the book, it did talk a lot about what, what that was like, what it was like to have to decide when you have to give something up in your personal life or give something up in your children's lives versus when to have to maybe make a sacrifice at work. She talked about that a lot. So the life part I felt like was focused on too much because I was like, I'm in this book for business advice. I want to learn about, you know, growing my own company, which to be fair, I probably was just reading the wrong book because this book was really targeted more at people who want to advance in corporate America. I didn't really think it forgot about the life part. Now, then again, it's been like four or five years since I've read the book. So it, anyone in the comments who's read it more recently, feel free to share a differing opinion because this is just based on having read it a long time ago. In the weeks before the big rollout, I was contacted by editors at several publications asking if I would write something about it. I knew exactly what they wanted. Not the main article, which would be a rapturous announcement of this bold American visionary. They wanted some crank to pump out a what about the children sidebar, pointing out that to lean into work you have to lean away from your family, to lend a spirit of objectivity to their 21 gun salutes to the author and book. Trust me, around 2013, I was the top crank for that kind of thing. Journalism in the Atlantic is very interesting to me because, it, I, I mean, it's magazine style journalism. It's the news magazine writing style, which is its own sort of writing voice and writing style. I've worked in journalism. I've primarily worked in music journalism in my life, although if you saw the video I put out the other week about my struggles in healthcare as a woman and things like that, uh, I never worked in healthcare, but I've had a lot of health issues in my life. So I wrote a medical narrative style journalism piece that wove in my own experiences. I think it's really interesting when people weave in their own experiences in an article that is also about something factual. And I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm saying I think it's interesting. That's both in a positive and a neutral way, not really in a negative way. I've seen some journalism in The Atlantic that has rubbed me the wrong way, particularly if you've seen the video that Cruel World Happy Mind did. She did a video, uh, it's in part two of the video, it's about the Atlantic article about the anti-MLM movement and I'm in that video. It's funny sometimes people ask me have you seen that video? I'm like I'm in it dude. <laughs> but I, it's long so if you didn't watch all the way through maybe you didn't see me. But I joined in around 45 minutes in and I'm dissecting that article with her and we're talking about how you know some of this journalism was biased, how I would have edited this article if I were coming at it from a certain perspective, but that's all dependent on the specific genre of article you're writing. This seems to be somewhat of a think piece and it definitely does have the author's voice in it very heavily. I don't necessarily think that that's bad. I'm waiting kind of to see where she goes with it before I make a judgment on that. But when I looked through the galley, the whole thing was so manufactured and be schoolish that I just wanted to put my head on the keyboard and have a little nap. Yeah, okay, this is, this, yeah, this is very opinionated. So I'm gonna go into this thinking, you know, this is more of an opinion piece. That's, that's fine. And I mean, that's fine depending on what types of conclusions she's going to draw from these opinions. I think B-schoolish is a funny term because if we talk about like Marie Forleo's B-school, you know, the whole like online business school, girl bosses selling courses on the internet, that's what imagery that brings to mind. I think that's kind of fun. Still, I myself had been leaning into the lucrative book reviewing space for a long time and I could tell there was money on the table because these Sheryl Sandberg packages were obviously going to be lavish. I did the honorable thing and read the book closely. Almost immediately I saw that its main problem wasn't the children. Okay, okay, so it looks like, okay, let's see where this goes. Up here when she says it was a sort of work-life balance category buster because she was willing to tell women to pretty much forget about the life part, this section it looks like the author is setting up to say that that's what the discourse surrounding the book was at the time that it came out. The author of this article is not necessarily saying that she agrees with this assessment, but that that was what the discourse surrounding it was. Because it seems that she actually ended up having a different opinion, and I think that's really interesting the way she pointed that out. This was a book about how women in corporate America could, and should, strive to get the most money and the most power. But where should they seek such power? In the crackling hellfire of C-suite America. This article is written in a super interesting way. It's definitely heavily opinionated and heavily infused with the author's own feelings. And that's not to say those feelings are wrong because I do share a lot of feelings with this author based on, I think there's a lot of issues with corporate America. If you've been on this channel for any amount of time, you probably know that. I think the writing is really interesting. It's very vivid. I love the, the crackling hellfire. Like there's, I mean, it's heavily opinionated, but it's also very vivid. 
she uses a lot of imagery just in this phrase, like the crackling, crackling, you've got like crackle, which is almost an onomatopoeia in the way that it describes that auditory imagery. And then hellfire that brings up, you know, immediate images to our mind of, you know, bright reds and oranges, warm colors, we see that. So right away, we've got this uh, incorporating multiple senses into it, immersing the reader right into the writing. I think the writing is good. It's also highly opinionated. So whether or not that's good for this article, I think it makes it a lot more interesting to read. And I'll see if I think it makes the article valuable in the long term. I'm very interested in dissecting this though. Sandberg evoked the name Goldman Sachs multiple times, in a good way. Mind you, this book was published five years after that despicable outfit played a major role in almost bankrupting the country. She tells us it was a seismic event when, in the late 90s, Goldman Sachs made a woman named Amy Goodfriend head of its US derivatives team. She stayed at the company until 2001. Amy's a bitch, but an honest bitch, one man said about her. That's, I mean, that's kind of me though. I'm kind of a bitch, but an honest bitch. Like, that's pretty true, right? I don't know what they mean by that. If I ever write one of these books, I'll call it A Few Honest Bitches and explain that if we can get the right kind of women inside these places, we might be able to burn them down. Why were the progressive worlds of publishing and journalism embracing this junk as some kind of giant step toward equality? It will surely go down in history as one of white feminism's greatest achievements. So I think that's an interesting assessment. So if I'm thinking about when I read the book Lean In, I can definitely see the white feminism angle. So for anyone who doesn't know, I think what a lot of people mean when they say white feminism is when your feminism doesn't focus on the struggles outside of white women. A lot of it is evocative of the suffragette movement, which the suffragette movement was very important for getting women the right to vote. However, a lot of the suffragette movement really mostly focused on white women and their particular needs and desires. It didn't really focus on the specific things that black women were facing or the specific prejudices that they were going through. A lot of the women in that were like, okay, we got the right to vote. It's all good. We don't need to worry about the civil rights movement. They kind of like packed it up and went on home. So when people talk about white feminism, a lot of times it's talking about feminism that isn't really inclusive to women who aren't white, who it, which doesn't really ignore the issues that affect women who are in different racial groups. You know, one example of that being uh, a lot of the discourse we've seen surrounding, say this so I don't get demonetized, or a lot of the discourse we've seen surrounding rights, women's rights to their own bodies regarding whether they want to have pregnancies or not, a lot of discourse we've seen surrounding that, a lot of people will say things like, well, could you imagine if the state decided to give all men mandatory vasectomies when they hit puberty. Imagine that. And a lot of people point out that that's kind of a white feminist way of looking at it because a lot of indigenous people were forcibly sterilized. So forcible sterilization is not like just some crazy idea that that theoretically could happen. It's a thing that has happened to a lot spe of specifically non-white people, specifically indigenous people. So that's something that people have talked about as a way to say, hey, let's let's look at this from a different lens, not just this one lens of your own perspective. So that's kind of what it's talking about there. I think that there are some examples of that in this book, specifically the way that the book does focus. It focuses exclusively on sexism and studies and research surrounding sexism, which I don't think is wrong because I think that focusing, the book is focused, it has a clear goal. However, it does ignore a lot of systemic issues. It, it does have that whole like, you know, work hard and you'll, you'll achieve greatness kind of narrative to it, which a lot of self-help books have. That's been my massive issue with a lot of this industry as a whole, right? It has that message kind of behind it of, you know, hard work and confidence and taking no prisoners or whatever that that's going to get you there. It ignores a lot of the systemic issues that, you know, women in poverty face or that single mothers face or that women who are facing racism may be dealing with and things like that. So it does kind of have such a narrow scope to it that I can absolutely see that being a valid criticism of the book. Let's continue and see where this author breaks it down. I didn't send Time a book review so much as a red flag warning. Time had published a cover story in the midst of a financial crisis called The Price of Greed. Lean In was a return to greed is good, but the editors didn't care about Cassandra in the sidebar. The copy was clean and they slapped on a title they liked. The title was What About the Children? Ooh, we're gonna, we're gonna look at that. Let's pull that article up. And I decided to act very Goldman Sachs about the situation. I cashed the check the day it arrived. This is always an interesting thing when someone talks about having taken the money for this situation. And now that I'm getting more into the meat of this article, I will say that my new assessment is that I'm glad that the author is inserting a lot of her own opinions into this because this is very clearly meant to be told from her perspective. This is about her feelings and reflections on the situation. I think that having this particularly be an opinion piece is a good move for making the article have the highest impact. 
Oh, this is the what about the children piece. So this is the piece that Caitlin Flanagan, this author, wrote and this came out in 2013 and the what about the children piece is what she they, what they called it against her will yeah we're gonna we're gonna take a look at this in a minute actually let's take a look at it right now Cheryl Sandberg's book Lean In is inherently dismissive about the deeply valuable job of child rearing that's what she said she didn't want it to do right okay well let's let's so let's see what time published and then we'll compare that to Caitlin Flanagan's corrections on I guess what she really wanted this article to be more like or what she really feels in retrospect this is interesting yeah because she wrote this original article and is now reflecting on it I think that this is a really interesting comparison here so she basically she's saying it's a school of thought that devolves from a simple and stark truth while women have made enormous gains over the past generation when it comes to the top jobs and the most powerful institutions they're all but absent and that is true and that is something that is valuable to write a book about sandberg a businesswoman is most concerned with women's vanishing act in the top realm of corporate america only 20 fortune 500 companies are run by women she reports in those companies women account for only 14 percent of executive officer positions and only 16 percent of board seats if you guys haven't already seen it this past december i did a video called the dave rule where it talks about how there's this running joke in silicon valley which has also been a joke in like the uk's top companies and things like that about how it's good enough diversity if we have as many women as we have guys named Dave because that uh, kind of shows the gender disparity. Uh, so check out the Dave Rule video because that, that kind of goes into that as well. The world would be a much better place, she argues, if half its institutions, including these money printing top corporations, were run by women. It's in all of our best interest, she argues, to support policies that would help more women land top jobs. All this sounds like a worthy cause until you pause to consider some of the firms she lionizes. Goldman Sachs, for example, gets star treatment featured in four separate glowing examples. Clearly, Sandberg would love to see the outfit eventually helmed by a woman. But the firm's current CEO earned over $20 million last year, and many of us are disinclined to view Goldman Sachs as an outfit dedicated to the Commonwealth. So it's hard to imagine a grassroots movement taking up the cause of the highly educated, hugely paid business women who might seek the position. I kind of feel bad that I didn't pick up on any of this Goldman Sachs stuff when I reviewed this book. Although I, I didn't do like a full like in-depth deep dive review of it on this channel. I read it years ago before I like did YouTube really. And then I talked about it in the tier ranking video. And I'm like, now I'm looking at this like, wow, I missed a lot of stuff. I forgot a lot of stuff. I'm sorry. <laughs> Moreover, Sandberg reports that one of the main reasons women undermine their chances of executive positions is that before they have children, they begin to craft career plans that would provide them with more flexibility and reduced responsibilities. This, says Sandberg, can result in the tragedy of women leaving the workforce altogether because their jobs become less satisfying than raising their children. In her view, staying home with children is simply a lifestyle choice, one that can be resisted by crafting a more attractive option in the workplace. Leaving a child with a paid caretaker is heart-wrenching. Only the possibility of compelling, challenging, and rewarding jobs, she writes, can make it a fair contest. So when it comes to the whole raising children discussion, there was definitely a lot of systemic elements absent from the book, such as discrimination, sexism in hiring. This is something I've talked about a lot when talking about some of the root causes of what makes a lot of MLM network marketing style companies target women, specifically mothers, which is that a boss, particularly a male boss, might discriminate against a woman who's pregnant and that's illegal to do but it does happen we've we've covered examples of it happening on this channel it does happen anyway and in addition to that even if you're not pregnant there are times where someone might say okay well this woman has a chance of becoming pregnant so if she does and decides to take maternity leave that's going to hurt our bottom line a lot of this comes from the inherent flaws in the current system that we have and the fact I've, again i'm not going to just get all preachy on this channel but talking about reasons why universal basic income why universal health care would go a long way to helping even the playing field because there are these inherent flaws with if somebody's capable of getting pregnant they're not going to be like worth as much to the boss which is a really dark way of viewing it but that's what happens when money is the bottom line in everything and when we require money to survive and we will die without it then money has to be the bottom line for a lot of people so again this is kind of like a inherent flaw of the system so I, I i get what's going on here i think sandberg's view in the book is an interesting one and i think it's worthy of discussion but i don't think it tells the complete story because she talks about how a lot of times women will subconsciously self-sabotage where they know that they want to raise, it becomes kind of a vicious cycle. They know that they want to have children one day. They know that if they're trying to get to the top of the company, they're going to get passed over if they decide to have children. So they kind of unintentionally self-sabotage and don't go for those higher positions because they want to be able to keep what they have rather than getting passed over for something bigger. As a result, they end up not being satisfied in their job and raising children ends up being more fulfilling. And that's why you see large swarms of women leaving the workforce. 
Does that happen sometimes? It probably does. I think there is more to the story as well, including hiring discrimination, including the fact that it's just baked into the fabric of the system as a whole. So that's definitely something valuable to talk about. I think that Sandberg makes interesting points, but doesn't tell the full story. And so for all its urgent voice of a new generation feeling, this is the familiar ground we've been pawing for yonks now, children versus career. Clearly, the bigger the career, the less you see your kids. By her own admission, Sandberg has missed her teacher conferences and pediatrician appointments. She's had to travel extensively even when her children were sick, and she's missed out on a level of detail about their lives. This is an interesting point as well, and I, again, I want people who have kids in the comments to let me know your experiences and perspectives with this, because I've never had kids, so I've never been able to experience this. Is this a thing that men worry about? Because sometimes a lot of people will say like, oh, I as the mom go to all the pediatrician appointments, I know all the kids' contacts, I do all the parent-teacher conferences at the school, and a lot of times the dad doesn't, but like men, specifically fathers who are watching this video right now, do you feel like you miss out? And women, do you feel like your husbands miss out? And women, do you feel like you miss out? I, just, I want everyone to share their perspectives because I'm curious about what people's thoughts are on this because I've never been in this position and can't speak to the experience. But I'm wondering, like, if she had to miss their doctor's appointments, like, did her husband just take them to the doctor's appointments? But I know he was a top-level executive, too. So, I mean, now you get into this point where it's back to the old argument of what's better, money or love, right? Where it's, like, money or time spent with your family. Because these kids are gonna be set up for the future. Like, they're never gonna have to worry about paying for college. They're never gonna have to worry about what whether a health emergency is going to destroy their entire lives financially because they've got two parents who, well, not anymore. Uh, I, Cheryl Sandberg's husband has unfortunately passed away. So I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be talking like that. I'm sorry. But at, at the very least, they did have a lot of financial privilege. Or at least they did at this time. At the time that the book came out, he was still alive. But she's been handsomely rewarded with a career for the ages, and it's hard to imagine her children have suffered over much for it, which is what I was saying. But again, that doesn't mean the children aren't suffering emotionally. There's the emotional and the physical and the financial, all these different elements of life kind of come together. They're not in a refugee camp in the Sudan. They're in a mansion in Silicon Valley with, I'm sure, some of the best caretakers money can buy, as well as parents who love them. Sandberg claims she wants to end the mommy wars, and she provides plenty of boilerplate about how staying home with children is demanding and important work. But whenever she frets that her children might be better off if she spent more time with them, she reminds herself that the future is based on pure emotion, not hard science. She then goes on to provide research providing that children do no better when raised by their mothers than they do when raised by competent hired caregivers. In other words, staying home to raise one's children really isn't that important, after all, or certainly not more important than making it to the top of corporate America. One thing that I think this book really missed talking about was stay-at-home dads, and maybe that's because they're not as common, but I wish that it had talked about them at all. That and child-free women, it didn't really talk about that at all, because the book didn't say that it was about being a mother in the workforce, it said it was about being a woman in business. That's what it said on the tin, right? So that's what I bought it thinking I was getting. And the only time in the book she mentioned child-free women wasn't even child-free women, it was childless women, as in a woman who doesn't currently have a child but may want one in the future or wants to have a child. So her only example was someone being like, hey, you can't give me more work just because I don't have children because how else am I supposed to be able to go out and meet someone and eventually start a family? And it's like, well, I, I don't want to start a family. I have all the family I need right here. Where's Chewy? I have all the family I need in the other room. If there's something brisk and bloodless in all of this, it's for good reason. If we're ever going to see a female CEO at Goldman Sachs or Exxon or Citigroup, she can't be someone who's dithering around pediatrician appointments and school parties. If a young woman has her heart set on one of these jobs, she should by all means read this book, which is guaranteed to stir her sense of institutionalized injustice. It's rousing up from the barricade spirit will allow her to feel like she's living her whole life in the spirit of Occupy Wall Street movement while actually occupying Wall Street. Win-win. I'm, I'm confused on this article and on the book as a whole at this point because I guess you could say like, socially men don't face the same pressure, but isn't every man who has kids, other than what I was saying about the systemic issue of hiring discrimination and promotion discrimination because of the possibility of pregnancy and maternity leave hurting the bottom line of a company and why capitalism incentivizes that, outside of like that whole systemic cause that we can't break free from without changing a lot of things and a lot of policies, outside of that, if the issue is exclusively we have children, we need to raise the children and go to work. Don't men also face this problem? Like, why is, if she's not going to frame it as an issue of systemic injustice or like systemic sexism and systemic prejudice, then how do men not face the exact same thing in that case? 
Maybe I'm missing something, but don't men have to also miss the pediatrician appointments if they're going to work? Or isn't the solution here to, <laughs> to make it so that families can live on either person's income or both can have an income if they want? Or like, this seems like a class issue above all else. But if a young woman is interested in arranging her life so that she can spend a great deal of time with her children while they're young, Lean In has little to offer her. It is inherently dismissive, as must all books about achieving top corporate success be dismissive, about the ultimate value of the deeply human and irreplaceable experience of raising one's children. Here's the inescapable truth. To lean into one thing is to lean away from something else. I mean, yes, that's a basic definition of opportunity cost. That's a pretty uh, basic economic concept. But again, that concept itself is not exclusive to women, which is why I think the, the failure to include the systemic issues is a huge gaping hole on the book's part and in the part of this review to be honest but Caitlin Flanagan who wrote this review we're gonna see in the Atlantic article we're going back to is going to continue talking about how she feels about this review in retrospect and some of the things she thinks now if there remain some business women who choose to put their children over their careers who would rather work at a diminished job because they find in child rearing something more valuable and significant than say investment banking we might not be witnesses to a national tragedy we might instead find evidence of some of the best impulses of the human spirit yeah I think this review is missing a lot because that review was missing, again, what the book was also missing, which is a discussion of how this affects women differently than men. Because if this is about women and the, the whole purpose of the book, the whole premise of the book is there are a disproportionate number of men rather than women occupying these particular positions, you need to discuss how it affects men differently. Because in that review didn't really go into it either. Uh, so I think that's a flaw on the writing of the book and the writing of that review. It's a flaw on the writing of that review that I didn't point out that that was a flaw in the book, if that makes sense. So apparently Caitlin Flanagan, the author, had uh, turned in her review and About the Children was the title Time Magazine gave it. That wasn't the title she wanted. And so she cashed her check and moved on with her life and is now reflecting on the past. So let's see what she has to say now. Sheryl Sandberg announced this month that she's resigning from Facebook, now called Meta, to focus on her philanthropy. Her work there is done. During her 14 years at the company, she's done so much damage to our society that we may never recover. The simple truth is that you cannot simultaneously dedicate yourself to making untold fortunes for a giant corporation and to championing a social good. That's fair. Facebook is creepy. Facebook has taken all our data. It completely redesigned the way that we, we, we get addicted to dopamine from social media. MySpace could never. Facebook, supposedly a wondrous no-charge gift to the world, was made of you and me. It needed our baby pictures, our religious and political affiliations. It needed the names of our high schools and employers and favorite movies and hometowns. It let us set up shop as, as the very particular and special individuals we are, and it was all free. In fact, it was ruinously expensive. So here's something interesting that I will say. I know I wasn't going to get preachy about universal basic income, but I kind of am. I talked about this in my business books tier ranking video as well that I have since in the past couple years become, I'm not really a fan of Andrew Yang as much as I used to be. I used to be a bigger fan of him before he ran for mayor of New York and his mayor for New York campaign was a hot mess and he said a lot of really stupid shit and did a lot of really stupid shit. However, I really appreciate the way he brought UBI into public consciousness because I really liked what his plan for it was, which was that companies like Facebook and Amazon and companies that rely on our data, which is our own property. Our information about ourselves belongs to us and we give it to these websites who sell it for a profit that they would be taxed at a higher rate based on that and that that money would be used as a fund to give people UBI. I thought that was a really good idea. And again, I'm not an expert. I'm not a politician. I thought that was a good idea in terms of how that might function both philosophically and theoretically, and hopefully it would work in practice, but I liked that idea of companies being penalized and us getting that money back because that data should have belonged to us all along. I thought that was a good idea. It's a shame he turned out to be the way he was. As the saying goes, if you're not paying for the product, then you are the product. There we were, suckers, lambs to the slaughter. It didn't even occur to us that all that information wasn't safe. We didn't want it to be safe. We wanted our long lost friends from Brownie Troop 347 to be able to find us. When we'd realized what we'd done, it was already too late. I think a lot of people still haven't realized what they've done. I mean, I'm putting myself out there on social media right now. You're watching me put my whole life out there. I mean, at least I'm profiting from it, I guess. 
During the Trump campaign, we got a taste of what a giant, mysterious corporation can do with all that information. A political consultancy called Cambridge Analytica had gotten hold of the personal data of up to 87 million Facebook users. That data was used in service of the psychological warfare that Steve Bannon wanted to wage against the American public. It sent voters down just the right rabbit holes. It whispered in their ears. It was a fooling some of the people all of the time operation. I'm not going to comment on that situation because it's incredibly complicated, so I'm, I'm just going to kind of leave that as it is. We made mistakes and I own them, Sandberg eventually said about the Cambridge Analytica scandal. They are on me. The impression was of radical transparency, a Harry Truman of the C-suite. The buck stops here. But according to the New York Times, the buck was about to embark on an oh the places you'll go journey to the bottom of the earth. Dude, her writing is so interesting. I wish she'd written the other article. Like the Time Magazine article was, wasn't shit compared to this. This is good. This is good. Sandberg oversaw the company's bizarre damage control efforts. It was an old school, dirty tricks campaign combined with the unimaginable power of Facebook. That campaign included hiring a Republican opposition research firm to discredit activist protesters in part by linking them to liberal financier George Soros, lobbying a Jewish civil rights group to cast some criticism of the company as anti-Semitic. Excuse me, Facebook did what? <laughs> That's me like every day, like a big, is this big corporation, you did what? <laughs> but more interesting is the way that Sandberg deployed some of her personal power. In Lean In, we were power posing, assuming male levels of self-confidence, asking for the big money and knowing we deserved it. But when the Daily Mail attempted to publish something unflattering about Sandberg's then boyfriend, the Activision Blizzard CEO, Bobby Kotick, of course she was dating him. Remember when I did that Activision Blizzard video? <laughs> of course she was. She seemed more like the head cheerleader standing up for the captain of the football team. On two separate occasions, she is said to have contacted the Daily Mail and successfully kept the information out of the paper. The source of the critical story recanted some of it and Sandberg denied pressuring the paper the Wall Street Journal reported. Okay, well, if that's unclear what actually happened, I can't really comment on that. I know that, you know how the song goes, don't trust a hoe? My real world advice is don't trust the Daily Mail. It's a fucking tabloid, dude. Look, I fully understand that as the result of this article, I'm going to wake up next to a horse's head. And all I ask is that it not be one of the weeks when I'm using the Paisley sheets. <laughs> See, she's killing it in this article. The writing's good here. Now we learn that Meta has been investigating Sandberg for possible misuse of company resources. The Wall Street Journal reported that some of her colleagues think she may have broken securities and exchange commission rules by having Facebook employees work on her pet projects. Oh, hell no! These include her Lean In Foundation, her second book, Option B, Facing Adversity, Building Resilience, and Finding Joy, and even her upcoming wedding to a consultant named Tom Bernthal. The journal reported that a Meta spokesperson declined to comment and that a spokesperson for Sandberg denied that she had inappropriately used company resources in connection with her wedding. Okay. This is, uh, it's all about the he said, she said. This is, uh, this is the he said, she said bullshit, right? That's what this is. I should have left well enough alone, but I couldn't help myself, and I googled the fiancé's company website, which reads, From Manila to London, we help Facebook with their most pressing communications and global brand strategy challenges. So this is a match made in heaven. Dude, could you imagine how exhausting a relationship would be if you're both, like, top-level executives? Like, you'd be rich as hell, but I just feel like it'd be exhausting. <laughs> It's going to be my own head bleeding out on the sheets, I realize now. I will have to pin a note to my pillow reminding the night caller of what Michael Clayton said. I'm not the guy you kill, I'm the guy you buy. <laughs> Dude, she is going full mad, lad. She's balls to the wall in this article. Remember at the beginning of this video, like half an hour ago, where I was like, hmm, this is a little bit opinionated. This has a lot of first person voice in it, and I'm not sure how I feel about that. Now I'm just like, yes, yes, Caitlin. <laughs> One lesson I learned in the Berkeley of my 1960s and 70s youth has never failed me. Huge corporations are never, ever on the side of the people. You can't take your eyes off them for a second. I mean, the Atlantic's not exactly a small corporation, but we'll, we'll let it slide. Because anytime you look away, they'll do terrible things like make napalm or Agent Orange or get desperately impoverished women in developing countries to use expensive baby formula instead of breastfeeding. Ah, she's not wrong! <laughs> Today's young people have been forced to learn that old lesson because they are the inheritors of 40 years of corporate greed, private equity, smash and grab, bank deregulation, and the collusion of the very rich and the U.S. government to squeeze every penny it can from the middle class and move it into the counting houses of billionaires. They know the game isn't rigged against them. They know the game was lost long before they were born. I'm feeling very depressed right now. <laughs> Corporations are now faced with labor shortages, and there are rumblings from the owner class about the demise of the great American work ethic. But corporations are the ones who killed it. That's not, that's true, dude. Everyone's out here like, there's a labor shortage. It's like, uh, remember, uh, you were the one championing the free market yesterday. 
If nobody wants to work for you, you gotta pay people more, dude. That's what the free market said. You were all free market 10 minutes ago when it was benefiting you. Young people today know that work is not your life. It's how you pay for your life. It's an exchange of money for labor and they are not interested in devoting a job of extra energy to jobs that pay minimum wage and offer no health insurance or savings plan for employers who show no loyalty to their workers. So this is wild, right? Like Time Magazine, her review, she wanted to go into this whole thing where she was like, this is a systemic issue of the ways that large corporations manipulate us. And Time Magazine was like, oh, let's just clean this up into a little article about whether women raise children or not. That sounds like a good article and we won't do anything further. I'm glad she wrote this follow up. This is good. These are signs that a real labor movement may be growing in this country. Here's another old lesson from my misspent youth. If workers organize, they become more powerful than the men or lean in women who own the companies. So farewell to Sheryl Sandberg, but maybe her departure is finally the moment to answer the question Time Magazine asked me so long ago. What about the children? I just got fucking chills. I got chills, <laughs> dude. <laughs> Reading some good journalism even if it's first person perspective journalism, even if it's narrative journalism, not narrative feature journalism. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be a nerd right now. Reading it gets me like so excited. Like it's just, my body just went, ooh. What about the children, dude? What about them? I've heard a number of young people lately say they won't have children because of the climate crisis. I mean, that's a valid reason not to have children, but I, I mean, that's, that's not a reason that you should pressure yourself not to have children, right? Like have children if you want to. That's not the reason I'm not having children. I'm not having children because the thought of pregnancy is so nauseating and terrifying to me. And also because I don't have any interest in raising children. I, I don't know if I just don't have a maternal instinct or what. I just, I don't, I'm almost 30. I feel like I should have probably felt it by now if I was going to. I don't feel any interest. I like kids. I like teaching creative writing to kids. I like writing books for kids. I think kids are cool. I don't want to be responsible for keeping any alive on my own. Couldn't, I, couldn't be me. That's a tremendous sacrifice and a principal position. A Pew Research Center survey from November found that 44% of adults without kids say they probably won't have any, up from about 37% in 2018, the last time Pew asked the question. But often, when you talk with these young people after the climate comes a whole lot of reasons the choice isn't a sacrifice at all. Children seem like a hassle and an impediment to a fun life. I should have kept reading. She was going to say what I was thinking. To them, I say, hold on. That's the corporation speaking, which seeks to cleave you from the human experience and sees you only as a worker, a unit of production. That's the corporate demand that you lean into work and lean away from your family. For some reason, a career is their baby, said Business Insider in its article in the Pew Results. So, I mean, I guess that's fair, but like, they, I don't think it's the corporation talking to me, and I don't know. I guess people who are in a cult don't think they're in a cult, so maybe I'm wrong. But like, I don't think it is because it's not that like, I don't want to have kids exclusively so I can focus on my career. I just like, I just don't feel any desire to. The way I see it is that like, if you... If you have kids, you should actively want to have kids. You shouldn't just not want not to have kids. You know what I mean? Like, you should actively want to be a parent because if you are going to parent children, that's a huge responsibility. So you should want to do it. And I think most people, most humans do want to do it. I just don't. Maybe it'll be different later, but I just, I don't want to do it. Staying home with very small children, Jesus Christ, there's no way to explain the amount of labor, tedium, and occasional desperation it includes. Yeah. Especially if you also work from home. Nothing is going right, the kids are running around, and you really can be brought to tears by mud tracked across a clean kitchen floor. Nothing to recommend it on that front, but here's the thing. Ask any older person when the happiest time in their life was, and they will always say it was when their children were young. Bro! Caitlin! Caitlin! Ah! She ruined it. She ruined it. I was loving this article. Remember how exciting this article was making me like a couple seconds ago? This is why it's good I didn't read this ahead of time because you're watching me live react to this. I'm going on an emotional roller coaster with this article, which in and of itself might make the article good because it's making me feel things. I wasn't expecting to feel things today. I felt at the beginning, I felt skepticism and then I felt indignance and then I felt like on her side and I felt excited and I felt just in love with the way she was using language. And now I feel mad, now I'm feeling anger. She's taken me through a whole range of feelings. I, I think everyone who wants to have children should have children, and I think that it is a, a systemic failure if people don't have children because they can't afford them, or because corporations are manipulating them, or because they think that they should have to choose between children and a career. I agree. But this is starting to sound like pro-parenting propaganda, 
I'm not trying to sound like an edgy person from the child-free subreddit, but anyone who doesn't want to have children, there's no shortage of people telling you how great having children is, okay? It's like you don't have- <laughs> do not even tell me anything I haven't heard before. A few weeks ago, I came up with the absurd project of digitizing all the photographs of my children taken from the pre-iPhone half of their lives. I bought the scanner and the cord to attach it to my computer. I hauled up the cardboard boxes and opened one and the whole endeavor stalled out. My children, thank God, are healthy young men living their adult lives. They're twins, 24 years old. But when I opened the box, I saw the faces of those little boys who aren't here anymore, the ones who lived with me in the dream time of early childhood. My husband worked and I stayed home and five long days a week we did things I knew they would never remember. Oh my God. This is making me sick now. Caitlin. Caitlin! Why did you ruin it? Why did you ruin it? Like, also, are you gonna, like, I'm, it's told again, I want to make this very clear. I support stay-at-home moms, stay-at-home dads, stay-at-home non-binary parents, parents who work, parents who both of you work, parents who neither of you work because, whether it's because you have disability or whether it's because you're rich or whatever, I want everyone to live their own life that makes them happiest in pursuit of their goals and doing what they can for other people and the betterment of society. Free choice, man, free choice. But for an article that's supposed to be reviewing Lean In and then doing a retrospective on the themes of Lean In, there's a shockingly absent reflection on, once again, this is what the Time Magazine article missed and this is what I was hoping that this reflection on it was going to go more into. This is a, it's obviously missing the discussion of stay-at-home moms versus stay-at-home dads. That's something that was missing from the Time Magazine article because again, while this article is delving more into the systemic failures of capitalism and how that led to this, and I appreciate that about it. But it's not talking about, okay, her, her husband worked and she stayed home. That's great. Good for you. I'm glad you did that and I support you 100%. But in this particular article, I want you to delve into why. Why didn't you work and he stayed at home? Why didn't both of you work? Why did it neither of you work? Why didn't neither of you work? The answer to that's probably pretty obvious because you needed an income. Great. So then what made you make the choice for him to work and you stay home? What, what made you make the choice? I'm not judging your choice. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm assigning no moral value to it. I'm asking you to tell me in an article you are writing what caused that. Okay? So she's saying here, like, the first time they heard the music of an ice cream truck, I bought them each a Pokemon Popsicle, and here's the mind-blowing thing. They had no idea was inside those wrappers till I took them off. Okay, but do you not care that your husband had to miss this moment? Like, if this was, like, so fulfilling and important, wouldn't you care that your husband had to miss this? Why don't you care that he had to miss this? Are you gonna, are you gonna bring that up? Are you gonna bring up that he had to miss this moment? Isn't that just as devastating for him as it would have been for you if you'd missed it? Or do you just have no empathy for your husband? Do you even love him, Caitlin? When I gave them those astonishing, perplexing, never-before-seen popsicles, my popsicle was raining, one of them said in confusion when it started dripping. They looked at me the way they often did in the dream time, as though I was the most wonderful and kind and important person in the whole world. In the corporation of their love, I was the top of the power structure. So, like, you don't even care that your husband had to miss that? You, you, you don't feel like you took that away from him? I'm not saying she did. I don't believe that she did. I'm asking her to question her own line of logic here. Because by your logic, you deprived him of that moment. Didn't you? Did the capitalist system deprive him of that moment? Yes. Did the lack of universal basic income deprive him of that moment? Yes. But from your article's own perspective, you're not examining the gender differences. So... What's your fucking point anymore, Caitlin? It's propaganda. That's her point. There's no greater joy in this life than having a baby. Shut the fuck up. Shut the- I'm- I'm so fucking mad at her now. You guys watch me go through the biggest emotional roller coaster of my life right now. Here's a person who's been uniquely designed to love you, and here is Goldman Sachs. Shut the fuck up! Oh my god! I want to look at these books that she's the author of, because now I'm very curious. Girl Land. A girl's biological and cultural milestones. Loving and loathing our inner housewife. The rituals and events that shape women's lives. Weddings, sex, housekeeping, and motherhood. I don't know shit about this woman. I need to look up more about her because this lady is making me fucking mad. Caitlin Flanagan, what else did you write? Girl. Now there's girl stop apologizing. Where's girl shut the fuck up? Is this like, is this like socialist racial hollows over here? What? What the fuck is any of this? So she talks about her experiences having cancer. I'm very sorry that you had to deal with it. The week the left stopped caring, caring about human rights. Anyone who talks about the right and the left. I mean, to be fair, I've probably done that before too. Oh, she shits on Meghan Markle. Yeah, this bitch. I'm gonna be misogynistic to you, Caitlin. What does she say about January 6th? I cannot. Oh, what do you- uh I ran out of articles. That was my last article on the Atlantic. Now I need to learn about Caitlin Flanagan. This is wild. 
Okay, hold up. Like, I cannot figure out what her angle is because she seemed to be, like, very anti-corporation, which is great. Who is this woman? Where's her controversies? Oh, it's not even here. I can't read any more of her Atlantic articles because I ran out of free articles. In her article, How Serfdom Saved the Women's Movement? I'm sorry, what? Flanagan challenged the narrative of economic and social liberation of women credited to feminism by accusing middle-class women of succeeding at the expense of foreign nannies and illegal workers. Oh, well, that's actually a good point. Like, she's actually right about that. So that's the thing is, I'm like, is this the weird, like, leftist trad wife subculture? Because that's a thing, right? It's not a huge thing, but there's, like, the leftist trad wife subculture. I'm, I'm mind blown by this woman right now. Let's look at this article from the Mother's Movement Online, Loving and Loathing Caitlin Flanagan. So basically, what I'm gathering from this article and what I'm gathering from what I read is that she's a really good writer. She's very good with language. She's very good with imagery. She's very good with putting those ideas together and writing them in a way that really captures the reader. And I think that that's fantastic for her as a writer. I hate how she bait and switched me with that fucking article. I'm so mad. So what are your guys' thoughts on all of this? Here's my thoughts. While Caitlin Flanagan may say that there's no greater joy in life than having a baby, I would say that there's no greater joy in life than eating my ass, Caitlin. So thank you guys for watching this video. I will see you guys again soon. In the meantime, keep on supporting small businesses and not big businesses. Don't be a big corporate simp, but that doesn't mean you have to have a baby either. Those are- Baby and corporation are not the only two genders, Caitlin. <laughs> Bye, everyone! Hit you some nuts. There was lots of memes. Makes me wonder if I should take up lesbianism. Chicago. You guys uh, asked for it.